Hello and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams and I'm going to get us started for today's session, 2023 Medicare Regulatory Update IPPS Final Rule. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers 1.5 CPE credits. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 75 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and now I would like to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams. We have Jonathan Mason, Director, Eric Lucas, Managing Director, and Michael Newall, Partner. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to Eric to get us started. Hi, thank you for your time today. I'm uh, Eric Lucas, the most recent addition to the Reimbursement Consulting Group at Moss Adams. I left healthcare consulting 20 years ago to manage the reimbursement function for Catholic Healthcare West, which at the time was a healthcare system consisting of about 50 hospitals over three states. I remained with that organization for 20 years. Many transactions later, that organization is now Common Spirit Health with 140 hospitals over 16 states. It was a fantastic opportunity that allowed me to build a reimbursement team and explore all the intricacies of healthcare reimbursement. In that capacity, I've been able to work closely with Moss Adams, and I couldn't be happier to now join the team. So let's get going. Here's the agenda for today. Uh, in covering the IPPS regs, we'll be talking about the MSDRGs uh, and changes to those, the payment rate update, regulatory changes to GME and wage index, Medicare DISH and uncompensated care payments, uh, including some of the activity we've been seeing with uh, audits. The Section 1115 waivers and how CMS has decided to treat those, as well as other payment and regulatory items for consideration and reimbursement related items. Which takes us in to our first polling question. Staffing continues to be a challenge, which could be keeping up with regulatory changes difficult, how would you describe your Medicare reimbursement staffing right now? And Eric, while people are responding, I'm going to chime in here just to let people know how to respond. Um, you will need to click the button next to the answer you choose and make sure you hit the submit button so that it registers for your CPE. Let me pull that back up so more people can respond. Thank you, Amy. 
And I do see some responses coming in through the Q&A window. Um, you will need to respond on the slide itself in order for it to track your CPE. All right, it looks like most have responded. We'll leave it up a few more seconds here. All right, Eric, here are the results. Well, the results aren't terribly surprising. It's the thing that I know I've contended with for a number of years, and it's the thing that I hear uh, have heard from my peers. So I, I guess it's not terribly surprising that um, the number of reimbursement people out there are, are few and far between. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, there we go. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Um, so we're going to start out with going through a, a few high-level slides uh, related to the to the changes to the DRGs themselves. Uh, first, uh, good news in that um, the DRG set remained constant. There was there were no changes proposed in the, in the proposed rule that was finalized. So we're still at 767 um, DRGs. CMS um, did propose and finalize a, a permanent 10% cap on a downward um, changes to relative weights. Um, in the proposed rule, CMS discussed it at length uh, its approach to looking at this, um, both at sort of the 5%, which captured almost 90 DRGs, and, and 25, 20% which captured only, only five DRGs and, and settled at 10%. So it doesn't capture a, a lot of DRGs, but there, there is some protection there in, in terms of uh, downward adjustment. Um, in the 2021 rule, CMS had had proposed or had some discussion about this sort of three-way split regarding severity levels and, and complications and comorbidities, and ultimately just elected to, to further delay that as uh, data continues to push through the public health emergency period, which is sort of a, a common theme um, that you'll see in, in most of this. And, and the next slide sort of um, touches on that as well um, in terms of the DRG uh, weight recalibration, um, CMS has proposed and, and ultimately elected to use the 2021 MedPAR file for claims in the, in the 2020 cost report file to sort of set the rates for 2023 with, with what they described as certain uh, modifications uh, related to COVID specifically um, basically calculating um, two sets of weights, one with and, and one without COVID claims and then and then blending those uh, together and then and then further modifying uh, how they were going to determine uh, the uh, outlier fixed loss threshold amount, which we'll talk about on another slide. And again, just to reiterate, um, CMS did implement um, a permanent 10% um, protection against uh, reductions in weight. In, in terms of a new technology add-on payments, there's been a lot of activity in the, in the last couple of years, and there was an extensive discussion in the, um, in the, in the proposed rule related to this, just sort of as a, as a level set. Um, the, the program allows for payment adjustments for new technology or relatively high cost technology that's not yet been the cost of which has not yet been baked into the into the rest of the, the system. For 2023, CMS approved eight uh, technologies uh, that 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 sought application for add on on payment, uh, conditionally approved one and then uh, continue to approve another that they approved in 2022, and then um, this is a, a multi-year process before the, the the data gets baked into the into the payment stream. So, 15 previously approved technologies will continue 
So that's a total of 25 um, that will be eligible for, for payment add-ons in, in 23 for an estimated expenditure of about $784 million. So let's now just touch on the, the rates themselves. Um, the inpatient operating rates for acute care hospitals are are, are set to increase at to, by 4.3%. This is a pretty significant jump from the proposed rule. Um, I guess um, beauty's in the eye of the beholder in terms of what hospitals will be facing in 2023 with regard to inflation and, and all the stuff that we're currently reading about. And I know your advocacy groups uh, pushed on this item pretty hard in, in, the, in the comments. Um, the 4.3% is a result of a market basket increase of, of 4.1 uh, minus a 0.3% multi-factor productivity a adjustment, which is sort of an, uh, a standard, plus a 0.5% uh, legislative adjustment that was enacted, uh, I believe, with MACRA and, and I think expires in 2023 and, and unless something um, additionally happens. So if you factor in the, the uh, um, the, re the reduction as a result of the increase in the outlier threshold amount, which, which we'll, we'll touch on, then the estimated increase in payments in 2023 is about $2.6 billion. But that's before you factor in a, a few items that are headed in the other direction. One is the disproportionate share uncompensated care pool payments that are, that are projected to go down $300 million, which is an improvement over what it was in the in the proposed rule, but you'll understand that a little bit better as Jonathan works through those slides. Um, the the uh, fall off of the items that were included uh, in new technology add-on payments uh, will experience a reduction. And the Medicare dependent uh, uh, hospitals and low volume hospitals will experience a reduction as a result of some add-on payments that um, that have been allocated to them um, that will expire in 2023 unless Congress um, extends those uh, payments. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But at least right now, um, that's what's sort of baked into the into the rule. Um, this is just a slide that um, that details the 2023 final rate as as opposed to the 2020. Two rate both for wage index hospital areas greater than one and, and less than one, and of course the the difference between the two is the percentage of the payment that's apportioned to wages, with the over one being at 67.6 percent, and the under under one being at 62 percent. So you can see the total is the same at 6,859 dollars and 50 cents. Once you add in the the capital rate of, of 483.76, and and then the difference uh, between the two would be um, the portion of the total base rate that's applicable to um, to wages, and this would be reflective of the increase that that I discussed in the in the previous slide. Um, as you all know, there is a, a number of items that uh, get baked into the payment formula that are implemented in, in a budget neutral way. Um, and this is uh, this uh, table outlines all those adjustments to the rate. So you start with the, the, the base rate um, and then factor in the market basket update. Here it's 3.8%. I'll explain that on the next slide. But then you can see the, the various items that um, that the payment is, is adjusted by, but no new money is used for that. So it, it basically is funded out of the base rate. So, you know, where you have um, uh, a, a cap policy on wage index for budget neutrality, that's an additional payment. So that's being taken away from the base rate. So everybody pays for those who participate in those specific payments. So this just outlines how you get from, from point A to point B as these these additional items are added on. This slide um, covers how the uh, market basket increase is, is applied among the hospitals 
that um, submit quality data and are meaningful users, designated meaningful users, or one or the other or neither. So you can see that if, if, if a hospital is adhering to everything, then the increase is, uh, here is 3.8%. What it doesn't, this slide uh, taken from the rule doesn't add on is the, the 0.5 legislative increase and so once you add that you'll you'll get to the 4.3 and, and that applies along the way but if you submit your uh, quality data but you're not a meaningful user that there's a, a fairly significant penalty um, there if you're not uh, submitting your quality data but you are a meaningful user it's not quite as severe and if and if you're not doing either you, you actually do not experience an increase in in payments year over year um, at all. This is, I'm not going to go over this, this is just a, a, a graph that, that kind of outlines sort of how the system works with the base rate, how it's divided with labor and non-labor depending on where your wage index is and then, and then once you add in the uh, a capital and, and, and multiply it times your weight you can, and, and, and your add-on payments, you can compute your overall payment. So and there's there's resources obviously online and on CMS website if, if, you, if you wanted to compute a specific ca uh, payment on the case. Now, in terms of the um, fixed uh, loss outlier threshold, as, as you know, to qualify for outlier payments, a, ca a case must have costs greater than the sum of the prospective payment rate for the MSDRG, any IME and DISH payments, uncompensated care payments, and any new uh, a a technology add-on payments and the threshold in, in order to qualify for additional payments. The, the proposed rule um, discussed continuing to use data that was sort of pre-public health emergency. The final rule um, modified that, and so the threshold is being computed using 2021 data that includes and excludes um, COVID cases, and then that data is averaged together. The um, the proposed threshold was 43,214, which you can see is a significant increase over, over what the threshold was last year at, at 30,988, and the revised threshold based on updated data and this methodology is, is 38, set at 38,859, which is still 25% greater than what it was in, in uh, fiscal year 2022. Um, so let's pivot a little bit um, to to GME. Um, the, um, the the basic um, item here that I, I wanted to, to cover um, had to do with CMS's proposed um, fix related to a, a court case um, that was decided in in favor of the hospitals in, in the in the Hershey case that had to do with um, FTE residents that exceed the FTE cap that that went over into the into the uh, fellowship arena and, and how that would be revised. Um, the big thing here, um, I'm not going to get into sort of who who qualifies and not, but the big thing here was CMS elected to to apply this change retroactive to cost reporting periods beginning on or after October 1st, 2001. So that's not a typo. Um, and there was a significant amount of pushback in the, in the comments re related to this, especially since the Hershey case um, seemed to have been decided on a statutory basis. So there was a lot of question on why a retroactive rule would, would have to be applied. And um, there is some applicability, potential applicability on other um, other items that are that are current be, currently being reviewed by the system in, in the appeals realm. Um, so retroactive application is, is sort of a dangerous thing in that it, it, it certainly can apply positive or negative, but at any rate, there's been some relief. Um, there's been a, a CMS is permitting uh, uh, GME affiliation agreements for urban and rural teaching hospitals that train residents in a rural track. Um, and then there also is a pool of money um, to reimburse hospitals for Medicare Advantage GME uh, uh, claims, and 
that is funded from the hospital pool. So there's uh, there's been a reduction um, in the amount of, of money that's set aside, and that's capped at sixty million dollars. So that just gets recalibrated as um, as CMS looks at that cap. Now, in terms of, of wage index, just sort of as a, as a refresher, there's an adjusted area wage index and an a unadjusted. The, the adjusted accounts for geographic reclass and, and the rural floor budget neutrality adjustment and an occupational mix and, and applies uh, principally to IPPS and, and OPPS uh, payments. And then the unadjusted, um, which excludes occupational mix, is applicable to skilled nursing, rehab, psych, and, and other payment mechanisms like ESRD and home health and, and, uh, and hospice. Um, CMS is elected to continue um, its low, low wage index uh, a policy um, whereby it boosts the wage index for hospitals with a wage index value below the 25th percentile. Um, this is despite a, 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 a provider favorable decision um, um, to the to the contrary from from district court that is still working its way through the system. Um, and while the lawsuit technically involves only fiscal year 2020, the, the court's decision uh, may have implication for 2023 and beyond. So CMS is elected just to continue with its policy while that continues to work through the system. Um, essentially, the lower 25th percentile receives additional funding as a result of the, the higher 25th percentile and it establishes this wage index at 0.8427 um, in order to accomplish that. Um, in terms of whole harmless, there had been a, a a 5% cap on wage decreases year over year um, that CMS proposed and ultimately um, made permanent. Um, so wage index decreases year over year greater than uh, 5%, regardless of the reason for the decrease, um, are capped at the, at the 5% if it, if it exceeds that amount. And this is being applied on a budget neutral basis. So there, if you go back to the slide I talked about earlier, there's a slide that, that covers how that's, how that's um, being funded as well. Um, and then there was just, uh, there was a proposal to clarify some reclassifications. Um, this is actually final um, with hospitals that have multiple campuses that, that reclassify as, as rural and, and just using the um, the main campus in order to um, in order to do that. Um, so to wrap up the the section, um, the the final 2023 unadjusted national average hourly wage is 47.79, um, and with occupational mix included, it's it's 47.73. There's an estimated 275 hospitals that would that are receiving an increase in their 2023 wage index um, as, as um, a result of the application of the rural floor um, and the imputed floor, which had been um, eliminated, in, uh, uh, I think, a couple of years ago and then, and then reinstituted, continues in 2023. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amy to cover our second polling question. Uh, actually, I right, think I'm going to steal the mic uh, for a second first, if you don't mind. Uh, we, we we do have a question, uh, Mike. Uh, somebody had asked if CMS is going to reopen cost report years back to 2001 for that GME um, matter, uh, if those are already NPR'd. Um, it's my understanding answer? that they are not, um, Eric, if um, – if it, if that is settled. Yeah, that we'll, is my answer, And we'll too. confirm that, and, yeah, we'll, and we can confirm that. We can include it later. But my understanding is they're not. Okay. And then uh, regarding low-volume adjustment, do you believe that they will restore the more recent requirements that were in effect last year and were allowed to expire, or will they remain set at the stringent requirements that were in effect years ago? 
And I, I'm um, going to say that I don't think we have any idea which way the, the how to read the tea leaves, the one that they did before was more related to uh, um, current environment. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would just mean, want to point out one other thing. I, I was I was a little blown away by the the increase to the outlier threshold, and and for those hospitals that are sensitive to uh, outlier payments, you might want to take a look at at how that higher threshold is going to ultimately impact uh, some of your services. Uh, and now I will step back, AB, and let you uh, take us to the poll <laughs> question. No worries. So the question has been up. It looks like um, most have responded. I do want to remind everyone that if you would like to receive PPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least uh, five of the six polling questions that we pull up here. We'll leave it up another five seconds. All right, here are the results. So that's um, that's good. This is this is important. Um, this is an annual uh, process, um, and there's a as you know uh, for preparing this and pulling the data from your, your hospitals. There's a lot that goes into this, um, and um, and this affects not only you but you know everyone else in in your geographic area. If there's multiple hospitals that make up the wage index for for your area, so it's important that to stay engaged with this. So with that, I think we'll now uh, turn it over to uh, Jonathan Mason. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, so we'll spend kind of a portion of the rest of our time covering the recent DISH updates, along with updates from the EC payment section of the rule, along with some of the data from the latest round of uh, the S10 audits. There was a significant or, or pretty significant drop in the size of the UC distribution uh, between this year's rule and last year, uh, as well as a new calculation for each hospital's UC payment. And so now it's using a blend of two S10s instead of just one. So for the final factor one, the uh, DISH estimate begins with an anchor period in this case, the 2019 data, which is then trended forward by a number of factors applied to the 2020 through 2023 periods. So as in the proposed rule, CMS used essentially the same assumptions and estimates used in prior years to, to arrive at the dish amounts, specifically for uh, fiscal year 2022, but CMS relied upon the Office of Actuary June 2022 Medicare DISH estimates in the final rule rather than the January 2022 estimates for the proposed rule. And so what that uh, did was increase this final rule um, quite significantly. Um, factor one increased approximately about 500 million higher than the proposed rule. Um, that's still 27 million less uh, than the final rule from last year. So the net result is a 2023 DISH estimate of 13.9 billion. So after removing the 25% empirically justified amount, the final factor one is 10.4 billion. So this slide just shows a view of the factor one from a trending standpoint uh, back to, to 2014. You can see roughly it's 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 gone up, and then obviously the last since 2020 uh, it's gone kind of steadily down. Um, it's very close to the same from last year's. Um, and so if we go to factor two, factor two, which is that factor calculating the change in the uninsured rate. So for calendar years 2022 and 2023, the estimated uninsured rate is 8.9% and 9.3%. And so then they're, those, uh, the, the calendar years are converted um, to the payment year using that weighted average. So ultimately gets to 9.2%. Uh, 
So after running it through the formula, the factor 2 now equals 65.71 as compared to last year's final rule of 68.57. That's a huge drop, um, and it's what is primarily causing the, the smaller size uh, pool this year. So to get to the final UC calculation, you apply that 65.71 to the 10.4 billion to derive an uncompensated care pool of $6.874 billion that will be distributed to uh, uh, roughly uh, 2380 qualifying hospitals. So this, um, like Mike mentioned before, this represents a decrease of about 318 million compared to last year's final rule totals. So on this next slide, you can see from a trending perspective uh, the UC pool. Um, in 2014, it was 9.03 billion, and then steadily declined as the rate of the uninsured declined in the U.S., or at least what was estimated decline using um, at that time CBO data. Uh, and then switch since the switch to some new metrics in 2018. And as a result of the changes of the various factors that impact coverage decisions under the Affordable Care Act, the rate of uninsured ticked up in 2018 and 19, with it basically being flat in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and, and now we see in 2022 and 2023 those big drops from either the factor one, or in this case, or for this year, the uh, the drop in factor two that led to the decrease in the in the 23 payments. So in regards to factor three, commenters have expressed uh, for the last several years actually that they're concerned that the the use of only one year of data to determine factor three would lead to significant variations in year to year UC payments. With uh, several commenters recommending at least two uh, or maybe more years um, of a historical S10 data to, to drive that UC payment. So in consideration of those comments, CMS proposed and has now finalized the use of both audited uh, fiscal year 2018 and audited fiscal year 2019 reports to derive the factor of three for fiscal year 2023. And so looking beyond 2023, CMS finalized their proposal that for the 2024 and subsequent years that they will move to a three-year average of the most recently audited fiscal years. So for 2024, CMS, CMS expects to use data from 2018, 2019, and 2020. So while the 2020 S10 audits currently be being performed will only impact one-third of your 2014 or 2024 payment, it will then be used again in your 25 and 2026 payment calculation. And Amy, I think it's time for the next polling question. All right, thank you. So our third polling question is, does your organization request a complete financial impact modeling report of the IPPS proposed and final rule each year? And if so, where do you get this information? And your options are A, we don't request modeling, B, we purchase from a vendor, C, our vendor provides complementary modeling, or D, we are looking for a source. And while you're responding, if you would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And then we're also sending them via email tomorrow along with a recording of this webcast. All right, most have responded. Let me pull up the results. All right, thanks, Amy. So, um, seems like it's kind of 50-50 here for, uh, you know, some do, some don't. Um, 
you know, obviously with what Mike's covered so far, um, what we're covering in the, the UC payment calculation changing so much year over year, that obviously certainly we would recommend um, modeling some of this out to give you a better picture of, of what some of these changes, uh, uh, how, how they would impact your organization. So I want to take a minute or the next couple of minutes and look at the results of the latest round of S10 audits as they've had a major impact on each hospital's UC payment. And so the analysis we're presenting is basically a comparison of the fiscal year 2018 and 2019 S10 numbers between the as-filed values and the revised values that resulted from either amendments and, and or audits. And so right now I'm going to focus on the 2019 audits. Uh, but I've kept the, the 2018 audit results on these slides because I think, as you can see, the results are very similar to the prior year. So for 2019, here we have a group that changed um, some 2,165 hospitals that had revised values during the period of June 2021 through March 2022, which is which is ultimately what, what they used to uh, pull the factor three numbers and, and distribute the UC payments. So in the aggregate, line 30, which drives that factor three calculation, decreased by uh, approximately $1.8 billion or 5.5%. So this is the un this is uncompensated care costs removed from hospitals, and that's resulting primarily um, from, from the uh, S10 audit. So to break this down a little further, uh, by looking at the reported charity charges on line 20, we'll go over the, the charity and bad debt, but starting with charity, of the uh, 2,165 hospitals in 2019 that had a line 30 change, uh, a little over 1,900 reflected a change in their reported charity charges. So as you can see, both uninsured charity and insured charity went down. Um, uninsured went down 687 million, uh, an insured charity went down 1.5 billion, uh, or close to 30%. And you can see that these findings are pretty consistent with the 2018 analysis and, and seems to indicate that hospitals are still struggling to properly report deductible co-insurance and co-payment amounts, uh, which ultimately is, is uh, all that is recorded on that insured charity line. And so while there is somewhat of a shift to, uh, to the uninsured bucket where the dollars were reporting incorrectly to begin with, so they would shift from insured to uninsured. I think the real story here is that the insured charity is not subject to that cost to charge ratio. So this is a dollar for dollar impact on line 30, and that's a massive hit to a hospital's calculated UC payment. So moving on to bad debt. Bad debts have continued to be a focus in these audits, and I think will continue to be, uh, certainly as these findings uh, show. Almost 1,900 hospitals uh, had a change in the 2019 year uh, to the tune of about, that's $1.7 billion, or, or a 4.34% reduction. That's slightly better than the 2018 results. Um, which showed about a 6.5% reduction. I think while hospitals are generally used to Medicare bad debt audits, these total bad debt reviews are still fairly new and are based more on the hospital's billing collection bad debt policies. Uh, we've talked to many hospitals that have focused on charity and their financial assistance policies, but there should be an increased focus, I think, on the, on the revenue cycle following a hospital's policies in this area because we're still seeing some, some rather large findings um, regarding bad debt. And to, to just give you a sense of the overall movement still in the reported S10 numbers, the average line 30 change for 2019 was $855,000. Um, and that's from the as filed report, ultimately what is in Hickris uh, used after the, the S10 audit. So we're still seeing huge changes in just 
what was filed and ultimately what is what was audited. Uh, you can see some of the, the largest decrease being, you know, 304 million and the largest increase, uh, 106 million. So needless to say, there's still, there's still a lot of movement in these numbers, um, um, primarily due to the audits um, and or revised listings at, at the time of audit. So um, there's still a lot, a lot of changes going on. And Amy, I think it's time for the next polling question. All right, so the fourth question, are you concerned about your uh, fiscal year 2021 UC reporting given your experience in the 2019 audit and or ongoing 2020 audit? A, we feel comfortable, uh, B, somewhat concerned, C, very concerned, or D, not applicable? And I would like to remind you that you do have the option to submit questions for the presenters using the Q&A window. And we do have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. All right, let me pull up the results here. Okay, so about 40% saying comfortable, uh, a little over 30% somewhat concerned. I think that's kind of right in line um, with what you know we're seeing on our side. Um, these these S10 audits. Um, vary by Mac, vary by auditor, um, are obviously getting more detailed as the audit protocol gets more detailed and the auditors get more comfortable with these audits. Um, uh, there's just more data requirements and we'll go into some of those. Um, so, so certainly can understand why there's some concern uh, with, these, with these ongoing audits. So that kind of segues, I guess, nicely into what are the next steps and best practices for for UC um, and, and Medicare DISH, but specifically for UC. So, like we mentioned, obviously the MACs are currently performing those S10 audits for federal 2020 fiscal years. Those are required to be completed by the MACs and uploaded into HICRIS by the end of the year. Um, so we know those are still going ongoing right now and make sure that uh, those are taken care of. Um, hospital systems really need to designate an individual or team of individuals to um, either prepare the S10 for filing and, and support it during the audit process. You know, that it really takes someone that's kind of a designated S10 preparer to stay abreast of kind of some of these regulatory changes, some of these issues uh, that we're seeing in audits. Um, you know, to pre better prepare yourself for future S10s um, and certainly better prepare yourself for uh, future S10 audits. We also think providers should take another look at their federal 21 cost reports to make sure that they've actually ca ac accurately captured all uncompensated care on those cost reports and decide on if they need to amend before these are most likely subject to an audit early next year. They, they, uh, in, in this year, fiscal year 2020, they st or the the 2020 S10 audits, they started those. Uh, is obviously dependent on your MAC, but we saw those as early as starting in February of this year for some of the, the hospitals that, that we support. So we know those audits can start as early as, as February. So if you do see issues that's either raised in um, preparing from last year or just what you're seeing in your 2020 audit, uh, now's the time to look at your 2021 cost reports and make sure that they are federal 21 cost reports and make sure that they're accurate. And then kind of skipping ahead to the last bullet point on this slide, CMS has proposed revised templates for DISH, charity, and total bad debt, as well as Medicare bad debt. And while not a part of this rule, these revised templates are on the horizon. 
and hospitals should prepare for more stringent filing requirements in the future. In just a few slides, we'll, we'll show you what those will look like, but that's, that's on the horizon and something that needs to be kind of looked at now uh, to make sure you're ahead and, and make sure you can, can meet those requirements going forward. So before I get to um, just those new filing requirements, I, I did want to take a brief minute uh, to update you on a recent court case this, uh, regarding dual eligible days in the Medicare dish calculation. So I won't read everything on this slide, but as many of you know, the issue of dual eligible days, you know, meaning eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid has been subject to litigation for quite some time in regard to where those days should be included either in the Medicaid or the Medicare SSI side uh, of, the, uh, of the fraction for the DISH calculation. So the Empire Health case was appealed to the Supreme Court and oral arguments were heard last fall. So on June 24th of this year, the Supreme Court issued a decision ultimately siding with the Health and Human Services and these days will continue to be included in the SSI fraction and not the Medicaid fraction. So in, which in most cases, uh, that's, a, that's at a detriment to the hospital's Medicare dish payment, but we, we know that's an issue that's been outstanding for, for quite some time. So um, at least in this regard, there's some, uh, a little bit of finality in, in the dual eligible days in the dish calculation. So as I mentioned before, CMS proposed new templates as part of revisions to the Medicare cost report earlier this summer. The comment period on those revisions has ended and we are just now currently waiting on CMS to finalize those proposals. As many of you, as many of you know, these proposals are very similar to what was referred to as a Transmittal 17 that was previously issued, but then never adopted. So these new instructions not only will now require new templates for cost report acceptance, they also require more detailed analysis of charges in regards to worksheet S10. So most of these changes would go into effect with cost reporting periods beginning on or after um, October 1st uh, of this year, 2022. So I'm not gonna go over all these in detail, but I'll highlight a few things from each of these new exhibits. The one thing uh, that we're looking at right now is uh, this is the Medicare dish template. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, they're asking for all obviously all the patient demographic information. But one thing I wanted to highlight was column eight, which is the state eligibility code. Um, they are now wanting that in your dish, dish listing. And I know obviously, obviously from experience, um, Ensuring that you have a program code for all days that you're you're claiming in the cost report can be difficult. Sometimes the uh, patients may not match. Uh, uh, there's multiple matching criteria for different states, um, so that's something to 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 look at to go back to um, whether it's your vendor, whether it's um, in-house. You know, what are you receiving Medicaid eligibility matches for all these? If you're not what kind of support do you have? Um, what what does that mean in terms of risk? What does that look like? Um, you can also see that they're wanting Medicare eligibility dates. Um, primarily, if they were Part A eligible, they, they they wouldn't be included. But obviously, if you had a Part B only, that's something that you would need to look at. Um, you would need to look at, obviously, if they're exhausted or, or, or maybe if their Part A coverage has already ended, you'd have to include those, those Medicare dates as well. So it's just more information than, that, than right now is currently required. And, and I think Medicaid eligibility is the, kind of the biggest one I would, I would flag in this. And then for... Medicare bad debts, there's also a new exhibit, uh, Exhibit 2A will replace the current Exhibit 2. And so while the format is similar to the current Exhibit 2, there's several new required columns that providers need to be aware of. 
One update is in regards to remittance, remittance advice dates. The current Exhibit 2 only has one column. Um, now you see two columns. Um, they want those separated into the Medicare and Medicaid. There's also now required or new required dates, and the descriptions are clear, such as AR write-off date, collection agency return date, collection cease date, and I think one more Medicare write-off date. So these additional columns will cause more work for the providers the first year they are implemented, um, but the hope would be that this would allow the audit process to go smoother as the auditors review these listings. And then charity, so moving on to S10, um, this is the charity exhibit that, that will now uh, be re required if these are finalized. This is exhibit 3B. So you can see this somewhat mirrors the S10 audit templates that a lot of you have uh, filled out before. There's some minor changes, um, and I won't go into all the details. I think one of the issues that I would bring up is obviously one of the challenges is grouping um, multiple write-offs down into one record that that they're wanting to see here. Also, tying out accounts from total charges down to ultimately what is written off or their current balance um, using all of these columns and separating them out um, can be challenging depending on timing, depending on payments, recoupments, payments, um, uh, and just making sure that these columns reconcile um, is a big undertaking um, and something that uh, if these go through will be not only required at audit, but it will be required at the time of any cost report filing. And then the last template um, that I'll go over is bad debt. So bad debt, again, this mirrors what's required for S10 audit. And one, I, one of the things that, that we see quite a bit is Total bad debt is challenging for hospitals to make sure that they're capturing all of their write-offs from active AR to bad debt, but then all of their recoveries, any um, write-offs, or, or I should say any adjustments that occurred while an account was in bad debt, any reversals, all of that needs to be accounted for and ultimately grouped all together um, within one encounter um, and placed on the on this column, so on this on this template, and just like in charity, you know you're going to have to reconcile charges down to ultimately what that writ was written off, and make sure that you're uh, accurately recording the columns. Um, and it can get uh, rather tricky if you're if charges are being transferred from bad debt to charity. Um, vice versa that doesn't happen as much but uh, definitely charges moving from bad debt to charity char charges moving off bad debt because of insurance was applied while the account was in bad debt all of that needs to be accounted for also be then recorded accurately on this on this template um, and so uh, that's going to be needed and just like with all these templates that i just covered all of these are required or will be required for cost reporting cost reports beginning on or after 10 1 2022. so i think it's time amy for the next polling question all right so the fifth polling question do you think you can produce complete and accurate data under the Paperwork Reduction Act requirements? A, yes, we should be able to. B, no, we have some work to do. C, not sure. Or D, not applicable. While we're waiting there, Jonathan, a couple questions. Um, one, a technical one. When should bad debt amounts be included uh, for S10? When sent to the collection agency or when an accountant is returned from the collection agency and written off? Uh, well, that, that question has been uh, asked for many years. And I, 
While CMS hasn't directly come out and answered that question through their audit process and through um, uh, just some of their Q&A, what the primary for total bad debt, what you need to know for when it's appropriate to claim on S10 is when it's removed from active AR and two bad debt. And primarily, not always, but most of the time we see that when it's first sent to collection. So it's it's not, if, if your facility or hospital um, writes off accounts that way when it's after internal collections and then sent to external collections, that's when it's transferred off AR. That's when it should be recorded on line 26. So it's a, a slightly different timing than obviously your Medicare bad debt that has to return from collection. And another one, I, I, I like this question. Are you seeing any issues in the 2020 S10 audit caused by COVID-19? Uh, that's a good question. I think, I think the issues, stem, there's, there's a lot of different factors. There's a factor of, we, we're, we are seeing a lot of, uh, and it's kind of somewhat related, a lot of HRSA payments that ultimately, um, if you're paid by a HRSA COVID-19 payment, those payments cannot be recorded as charity or bad debt. So we're still seeing a lot of those that hospitals are including in Worksheet S10. Ultimately, those should be removed uh, as the requirements of that, of the terms and conditions that that's payment in full. So no, uh, but we also see, and maybe this is where kind of it's driving at is because of COVID-19 and maybe staffing issues and, and shortages, we're seeing more issues where a certain transaction code is not always being used appropriately. And, and I think, and this is just my opinion, is that stems somewhat from COVID-19 and the issues of just staffing shortages and just not being able to train staff appropriately um, and, and we see that in issues now stemming up where um, codes are just not being assigned correctly. So it's more of the procedures, the policies correct and the transaction codes that are using that, but actually down to the procedures and the documentation has been a struggle through some of these, uh, ultimately what is at the beginning of the COVID year uh, for the 2020 audits that we're, we're going through right now. And we'll do one more question. Uh, what about multiple remit dates from Medicare where they pay, take back and pay again? Uh, PA systems that have all dates. We struggle with getting correct remittances. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a struggle. That's certainly always been a struggle, even with, and primarily, obviously, if you're talking about a Medicare payments, recoupments, payments, that, that's mostly driven to Medicare bad debt. And, and one of the, the things that we always work with hospitals is, is that really spending a lot of time on how you're extracting the data from your system. Um, if, you, if you're extracting the data and then trying to populate the report, but the extraction isn't correct and you're not, it's, it's that old phrase, garbage in, garbage out. The, the most important piece, make sure you understand your subject, you test it, you test those transaction codes, you test everything after you've pulled that extract to make sure that you have it correct, and, and then you work from there to, to record, you know, to report the values appropriately. All right, I'm going to okay. pull up the polling results. Oh, let's see. Here they are. All right. So kind of putting them together, it's kind of uh, almost half. Um, I think they should be able to, and that's good. And I, I know for the, you know, 12% that's not no and then 28% not sure, um, you know, at least for uh, this, these requirements regarding the templates and the new instructions, you, you do have a little bit of time. Uh, obviously, those don't start until your the cost report period beginning on or after that 10-1-2022, but 
like I mentioned before, the more you can do up front, um, the, the, the easier it is. So we, I would recommend spending some time with your IT decision support and making sure that you can pull um, these reports accurately to ultimately provide these templates in compliance with these new instructions. So moving on to, to Section 1115 waivers, um, just wanted to spend just the, the next two slides to go over these 1115 waivers. That There's been a long history related to waiver days and what can and cannot be included in the Medicaid fraction of the DISH calculation. And this stretches back all the way to at least 2000 when the Secretary issued a rule governing this issue. So that rule was followed by another in 2004, further clarifying CMS's position, and some court activity occurred after that. So there's been a long kind of line of recent court cases, and some of those noted on this slide, where the courts have ruled that waiver programs that provide payments through an uncompensated care pool program or through a premium assistance program are allowable in the Medicare DISH calculation as these patients are regarded as Medicaid eligible during their stay. So in the 2022 proposed rule, CMS clarified their position and proposed to include only days in which a patient directly received inpatient hospital coverage from a Section 1115 waiver day. So this would have excluded days where hospitals receive payment from that UC pool and would have also excluded days for patients who receive premium assistance through a waiver. And so that's, that's ultimately in several states um, have those different criteria. So after receiving feedback on this proposal, CMS chose not to finalize that, but stated they plan to revisit the issue in future rulemaking. So that sets the stage to what happened in this rule. So in this year's 2023 rule, CMS proposed to make three changes related to the inclusion of these days in the DISH calculation. As it did last year, CMS is first proposing to specifically exclude patient days where hospitals receive payment or services furnished to inpatients from a UC pool under a Section 1115 waiver. Uh, CMS claimed that such waiver programs do not provide inpatient health coverage directly to patients or make payments on behalf of specific covered individuals. And second, and this is where it's a little different than 2022 rule, CMS decided that patients who receive premium assistance under a 1115 waiver can be included in the Medicaid fraction as long as the assistance is equal to or greater than 90% of the cost of health insurance. And then lastly, CMS proposed to change the existing requirement that the patient receive inpatient hospital benefits under the waiver to be included in the DISH calculation to instead require that the patient receive essential, essential health benefits. Um, so having said all of that and gone through kind of the history, um, CMS again, just like last year, has chose not to finalize this uh, proposal in the final rule. Instead, the only comment was that they expect to revisit the issue on 1115 waiver days in the future rulemaking. So obviously that's why we kind of covered uh, what's been happening with these 1115 waivers and uh, obviously probably this won't be the last time we see CMS attempt to revise their opinion on these types of days in the DISH calculation. So we recommend providers right now look at how they are treating these days in their calculations and make sure that they are properly accounted for. And I think with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Mike for some additional payment and regulatory items to consider. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, not going into a lot of uh, detail here, but um, I think we probably could host a, a whole webinar on, on some of these other items. I, for me, the, the important thing is um, during this period of the public health emergency, a, a number of decisions had to be made regarding what will or will not be applicable as it relates to how it may impact hospitals, particularly where data is used to, to, to drive the decision. So 
as you all know, for things like the hospital readmission, you know, reduction program or the value-based purchasing program or hospital-acquired hospital condition uh, program or the quality program, CMS has made a number of decisions over the, over the last several years of, of regarding what to apply and, and what not to apply based on data. So in this particular rules, uh, with regard to hospital, the hospital readmission uh, program, CMS will resume um, using data related to um, uh, certain items, uh, specifically um, pneumonia uh, that was previously suppressed, um, and we'll also continue to, to look at other items as they do or do not relate to the, the COVID-19 claims. Um, with regard to the hospital value-based uh, purchasing program, CMS did finalize the suppression of uh, consumer uh, assessment and health provider system data um, that it had previously, also for, for the same reason. Um, in terms of the hospital-acquired condition program, um, CMS continues to suppress certain measures from that calculation to, to not negatively impact uh, hospitals from, from the scoring that, that takes place uh, under that. And then under the quality program, CMS is adopting um, 10 new measures to, to be included there. So the point being, I think there's some additional in-depth reading required, um, not only on um, how these programs worked in the past and then what was included or excluded or, or suspended during the public health emergency, but what's now slowly being reincorporated back in and, and how you think that may unfold in the next cycle or two as, as you're looking to make projections on, you know, where your, where your revenue stream is, is coming from with regard to inpatient um, prospective payment system. Uh, re reimbursement. Um, and there was also some additional uh, discussion about continuing to report not only COVID information, but um, maybe even some seasonal flu information that I, I think CMS ultimately backed off on some of it in the, in the final rule. But the, the point was this is some significant reporting that re requires time and, and annual cost. So as you continue to engage with you know, your congressional delegation, these are the kinds of items that that I think you may want to talk about um, and, and have a debate on, you know, the the cost versus a benefit of this information. Benefit may come back to you in terms of additional information that you don't currently have that would be helpful in, in operating the hospital. And then with that, um, I'll turn this back over to Amy for, for I think our last uh, polling question. Yes, so this is our last question. Uh, given the continued increase in regulatory reporting and reimbursement changes, bandwidth could be a challenge at many organizations. Do you plan on bidding out any reimbursement services in the future? A yes, B no, C I don't know, or D not applicable. And then also, once you've completed all of your CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate right from the console in the CPE progress window. All right, we'll leave this up another five seconds to make sure everyone gets their credit here. Okay, here are the results. So there's a there there's still a number um, that are kind of wrestling with um, with with some of this um, and not really sure. Uh, where to turn. So there's certainly resources um, available um, for, for, for people to tap to sort of help with, with some of this information. 
Um, this last section, um, we wanted to cover a little bit of um, some sort of outlook and, and trending um, information uh, specifically um, outlined in the most recent um, trustees report to Congress regarding the health of the, the health insurance trust fund. Um, and I think the point here is, as you look at all of the final rules that have, that have come out in this cycle, inclu including this one and, and then the, the, the one that will be coming up with, with OPPS, um, and, and how it relates to where, you know, the industry is headed in, in terms of the health of payments, I think will we'll shape not only how, how we all look at our, our projected performance in the future, but conversations that we're going to have with our, our policymakers. So if you, if you look at this slide and, and stick to the first column, the, the health insurance or the, or the Part A trust fund, you can see that you know, projected income is at 337.4 um, billion with projected expenditures at 328 billion. And that's a, a pretty small gap be, between the two, only eight and a half um, billion dollars. And you can see from the expenditures uh, column about a, almost 145 billion will be going um, to hospitals uh, for payments, but but also 148 billion will be going to Part C um, health plans, and that's on the on the Part A side, not including the 200 billion on the on sort of the Part B side for for almost 350 billion. And kind of part of the point here is regarding Medicare Advantage um, 2021 um, with Part C expenditures being over 350. A billion, that's about 42% of the total pie with the expectation that Part C is going to grow to roughly 50% of the uh, program before uh, too much longer. So that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the number uh, to watch. Um, in terms of the, the trust fund itself, um, if you look here at at 2028, 2028 is the year in which, um, not the year in which expenditures are greater than income, but the but the year in which expenditures are greater than income and the fund has also eaten into the, the beginning balance to create an actual overall um, deficit um, in, in the fund or the so-called insolvency date. Now, I, I've used this slide before and I've had Plenty of people tell me, well, Mike, um, you know, the, the report has been projecting the insolvency of the, of the fund for a long time. Um, you know, what's really going to happen? And that's true, but if you, if, but if you kind of go back in time and, and look at iterations, the time from the report to the projected insolvency in between was, is, has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking over time. So this is a... 2022 report comparing 21, so you're, you're now looking at a potential problem in in um, 2028. This is um, this is just a graphical view of that. It's not a very attractive slide. Kind of sort of see it um, dropping off in that in that 2028 um, time frame. Um, this wasn't as troubling of a, of a slide. Um, when I was presenting it back when the proposed rule was issued because you can see the assumptions about the, the CPI being at roughly 2.5% um, and then some of the other factors that adjust that. But when you look at this year where it was 4.1%, um, then that significantly impacts expenditures, um, which also will, will play into how these numbers uh, flow through the report. So I think that's um, something to continue to, to watch. And as payments are adjusted um, kind of for inflation, um, how will that ultimately impact versus what's happening on the on the on the income on the income side? Um, you know, if you if you look at some some recent uh, testimony from 
from MedPAC, um, the estimate is over the next 10 years that Medicare spending will will double to, to 1.8 trillion dollars, and that makes up you know 19% of total federal spending by 2031. And we talked a little bit about the, the projections of, of when insolvency may occur. So what's the remedy? Well, you know, it, it could be multiple things, and I think we've seen some of this come out in some recent proposals, but, you know, there certainly could be an increase in the payroll taxes to, to, to increase the amount of income going in, into the fund, um, and that would be a pretty big jump, you know, from 3% to 3.7%, maybe greater now, um, or reduce spending um, or some combination of the two. So this is something that I think, you know, all hospitals would would be in, engaged in. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight, and, and I think you saw it in um, in some comments that, that were made to the proposed rule, but, you know, if you look at what MedPAC report has been showing um, and, and comments that they made to the proposed rule, you know, their perception and, and, and based on their analysis and, and data is that, that payment rates for certain sectors of the program, like skilled nursing and, and home health, um, rehab and, and hospice are unnecessarily high, and they've actually um, recommended a rollback of, of those rates, um, which I don't think CMS had the authority to, to do, but recognize those, those comments. And um, at least based on this information, um, that those rollbacks would, would save a significant amount of, of money over five years um, and then we also talked about um, the increase in the, in the growth in the Medicare Advantage uh, program with, with enrollment increasing over 10% per year, 46% um, represented now and, and, and expected to increase. And I guess the other thing here is payment rates um, through that program are estimated to equal 104% of of the payment rates that would be spent if, if those beneficiaries remain in fee-for-service. So there's some there's going to be some payment pressure on that side um, as, as well as just the overall growth in the, in the program that's, that's going to impact, you know, how things look um, going forward. Um, and again, um, there's, there's differences that are being represented by how things are, are coded with MA plans being uh, higher. Um, and the, the upshot is spending is going to continue to increase and will it continue to outpace uh, funding that's, that's coming in and what, what effect will that have on when that might occur um, and, and, and future legislative, um, and future legislative d decisions. Now, as you all know, you know, you know, your advocacy groups, both through AHA and, and state hospital associations, continue to be engaged. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how to treat some of the provider relief funding and the extension of the, the sequester re relief that's, that's currently in, in place. Um, also, with regard to the repayment of the, you know, the accelerated in, in, the, in the advanced uh, payments. And then I think you saw there was some movement on relief related to qualification based on dish factors for 340B eligible hospitals, although it was sort of in a narrow, it was in a narrow span of time. And I, I, I certainly haven't talked to a hospital yet that hasn't brought up expense related issues specifically related with the, the cost of nursing and, and, the, and the travel nurse rates. And that certainly played into um, discussions and, and numerous comments that CMS received with regard to the, the CPI increase and in, in payment rates keeping up with um, with inflation. So, so those items are going to continue to, to go. So I think with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it back over to Eric and see if he can help bring, the, bring us in for a landing with some closing thoughts. And maybe if we have time, we could entertain a couple more um, questions. So, Eric, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, I, 
thinking about those last set of slides as you were talking about them, I'm, I'm remembering that MedPAC has, uh, over the last few years, been recommending a lot of those cuts. And I, I certainly felt like Chicken Little year after year telling hospital CFOs that they need to be anticipating these cuts only to have them not happening. Uh, but as you look at the trust fund and see uh, its, its financial health changing, uh, we actually might start to see Congress responding to some of MedPAC's recommendations here as it relates to payment rates. So it's it's interesting to kind of see that in context. Um, you know, the the IPPS or all the the um, rate setting uh, rules uh, certainly become quite a voluminous uh, process. Uh, the the regs themselves were a much shorter thing about. 20 years ago, uh, and what used to be a singular job by a reimbursement person uh, has now become something more like a book club uh, as you pull together different stakeholders and talk about these issues that are affecting so many different things other than just the reimbursement. Uh, and uh, it was typical that we would take these issues uh, or, or take these regulations and summarize them and, and look at the different interpretations because there will be some different interpretations floating out there uh, and start a process of number one, uh, identifying the impacts uh, for the hospital or the estimated impacts um, using some trending data and seeing how it compares to expectations. I think that one's probably the more obvious uh, but then to start looking at some of the strategies that uh, were being reviewed or have been implemented or in the process of being implemented uh, to see how these changes might impact those. Uh, because, I, you know, a lot of those are, are items that were uh, expecting a certain rate level or a certain set of regulations, and that could certainly uh, impact those. And then the process switches to, okay, where are the risks? where are the obstacles that we're going to need to deal with, and where's, where's the changes to our workflow um, that we, we need to start addressing? You know, are we going to need to add staff to do any of the things that, that CMS is going to be requiring for Medicare reimbursement? Uh, and once we got through all that process, it was, okay, what are the opportunities here presented? What additional payment streams are available? What, what things have they had CMS clarified here that will allow us to change our policies um, to improve our reimbursement or change change our processes so that we can uh, claim reimbursement that we might be either um, ha have ignored or um, that now has, has become available to us. So I, I certainly can appreciate the job that many of you have in front of you as you, you know, adopt uh, these new uh, regulations. Uh, I have a few lasting questions that I want to try to get through. I know we're not going to be able to answer all of them, and, and as Amy said earlier, we will uh, circle back um, and, and respond if we don't get to it today. Um, one of the first ones, Jonathan, this is for you, the data files that the MAC are requesting for the uh, Worksheet S10 audits are getting so detailed and so extensive that some hospitals, especially smaller facilities, do not have the programming ability to comply with. Are you hearing similar concerns with, from some other providers? Yeah, I think that's a resounding yes. Um, that is what we keep hearing across the country. And, and, and actually, I've had numerous conversations with, with Max um, and, and their auditors and, and, and most of them understand that these are, you know, just the the amounts of data and the hundreds of thousands of rows, to some cases millions of, of rows of, of data and parsing that out and, and preparing it on uh, templates and then obviously being asked questions regarding those and making changes is a big, huge undertaking um, and, and something that, fortunately, uh, at least from the templates, is, is is not going away. It's actually where where I see this going is uh, the point being the templates are going to be filed on the cost report, and therefore then you know in theory those can just be used straight for the audit. Um, and and that time period that you now have to kind of revise it and make these new templates 
I think it's slowly going to go away as they implement these templates from the time of the ad filed. So I think I think now, unfortunately, is the time to 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 make the investment to make sure you can to extract this data with whatever system, whether it's Epic, Cern, or Star, Meditech, whatever, or, or other system that you have, is to, to to spend the resources now to get it get it correct. Uh, I think that leads into the, to another question, which you, you alluded to here. Uh, we have a legacy system that would need to be updated to include the new information. How how can that be handled? How should that be handled? Yeah, that's difficult. Obviously, each case of those legacy systems is kind of on a case-by-case -case situation. I know sometimes that data is archived. Sometimes there's a cost with unarchiving it. Um, it also depends on how much data from that archive system actually would be reported on S10. Um, you, know, you know, a lot of times is that just, you know, recoveries from bad debt or is that ultimately actually charity write-offs or, or, or bad debt write-offs that you claim? So I think part of that is a case-by-case -case situation, um, and, and certainly that's challenging. We've been successful with, 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 with dealing with some MACs on knowing that there is a small subset of data from legacy system and, and telling them what we can um, provide out of that system and, and what may be challenging. And, and I think that just means there needs to be an open dialogue with, with your auditor when you get to that section, to hopefully work through some of these challenges. I know we've been successful in that way and showing them what we can and cannot pull and ultimately going from there, whether that requires more testing for those patients and uh, but working through that with the MAC um, is, is the way we've been successful with a lot of those where we can't just pull the data out of that legacy system. Uh, here, here's a question uh, a little bit easier than the last one, um, but and I, you did touch on it, but I guess it's very topical. Uh, I want to make sure that it hits home. How does the HRSA charity COVID fund get accounted for? Well, on Worksheet S10, the actual payments that are received or the HRSA, you know, that COVID-19 funding, whether it was from the original funding or subsequent funds, typically that's reported on that line 18, which is basically where you where you put any kind of government grants or funds or any anything related to that on a on a lump sum basis. Part of what I was referring to is uh, obviously there are the HRSA COVID-19 where you're getting actual um, reimbursement for that stay at kind of the Medicare rate. Um, I know those, those, I believe those funds have actually, uh, uh, you know, they're, they've run out of those funds. Um, but uh, part of that is just to make sure that you can identify the uh, whether that's the transaction code, whether that's the payer in your system that have these HRSA payments on it, and just make sure that you're not including any charges from those accounts in charity or bad debt, um, because that's what that's what auditors are looking for. They're making sure that you're not receiving payment from HRSA. That's on that side, and then the actual just COVID-19 may receive as a lump sum that goes on that line 18. Okay. Did you get cut off there, Jonathan? Oh, I think I did. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. Um, okay. Well, we have uh, a bit left and wanted to to um, indicate that we are available. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to, if we did get to questions that you've posted, we will absolutely, uh, as I said earlier, get back to you and make sure that we post those for you. Uh, there's some resources available to you. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Amy. All right, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Jonathan and Mike, for a great presentation today. I also want to thank our audience for being engaged and submitting your questions to help guide today's conversation. 
And then also, if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have difficulty downloading it now. And in the upper right-hand corner of your console, there is a banner that you can click to be taken to the registration page of our annual healthcare conference. Uh, which will be in Las Vegas this November, so definitely check that out. And finally, here's a link to an online survey for today's presentation. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time. Take care, everyone.